I don't think that you have to have hearing loss to be a good audiologist, but I know that these experiences have made me a better one because I get it. I've been, like you said, on that other side of the sound booth, just as much as I've been in the shoes of the professional. And I just connect with my patients in a way that school can't teach you. I mean, it's my truth. It's what I live every single day. Welcome back to the All About Audiology podcast. I am your host, Dr. Lilach Saperstein, and this is the show where we talk about audiology and how it impacts your life more than just X's and O's, audiograms, and hearing aids. But what does it actually mean when you have an encounter with an audiologist, when your child has hearing loss, when you're going through this process? So that is what we do here on the show. And I am joined today by Dr. Laura Pritesi from the Citrus Hearing Clinic in Claremont, Florida, She is an audiologist, and she's going to share what it's like to be an audiologist also with experience on the other side of the audiology booth as a patient. So welcome, Dr. Laura. How are you? Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Again, should we tell them? (laughs) We had a little recording snafu about a year ago, and it was like, whoops. So that audio is no longer, and amen for second chances. So thank you for coming again to the show. (laughs) I'm very happy to be back. Awesome. So the last time we spoke was last February and it was like, oh, a pandemic is maybe coming or not. Like it was like maybe the second week of lockdown and everyone was still into Zoom. (laughs) Life looks very different now than it did then, for sure. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm sure that is coming into play, obviously with the infection control precautions and like closures, lockdowns, et cetera. So how's that affected your practice this year? Oh gosh, it was hard. Our governor of our state mandated that non-essential healthcare practices be closed down. So we were closed by executive order from March until May of 2020. And when we did open back up, we were very slow. We were very like spacing appointments apart and really taking the time to like make sure we were cleaning everything in between. We just didn't know a lot about COVID at the time. And thankfully now Now we kind of got a handle on it. We're faster with knowing what we've got to do and when, and we're still kind of doing curbside clean and checks or remote programming where we can. There's just so many things in audiology that require in-person care, like getting earwax out of ears. I mean, you can't do that over Zoom. So it's been interesting for sure, but thankfully I have managed to get my two vaccines. So we're hopefully coming to the light at the end of the tunnel. That's wonderful. I just keep thinking about the tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, soundproof room, computers, like all the things. And then it's just like, well, I guess we don't need any of this. Like, hmm. (laughs) It was a good push to get me more comfortable with some of the remote programming features with some of the manufacturers, which it's been out there for a little bit of time. It's not without bugs though. And sometimes it's dependent on the patient having stable internet connection or understanding on their end how to get logged in through the app to pull up their own programming screen or how to accept the changes that come through. So there's definitely been some manufacturers that I think that their remote programming works a little bit better than others, but you know, we've been figuring it out. Yeah. Again, just even in person in clinic programming is always a bunch of tangled wires or like the remote, even when it's Bluetooth, is that connecting? Yes. Connecting, not connecting, jiggle wires. Anyway. So that's what many people have experienced this year. And thank you for, you know, sticking it out and care for all the patients that rely on you. So let's back up a little and, you know, I feel like I already know you, but the audience needs to get to know Dr. Laura. So tell us a little about yourself, your background, why you got into audiology, basically anything you want to share. So I was born with a hearing loss and it was identified when I was five years old. This was kind of before the universal newborn hearing screening programs existed. So I slipped through the cracks there a little bit, but uh, my preschool was having hearing screenings prior to us all going into kindergarten. And my mom was concerned. My mom had her master's in early childhood education and she just knew her gut instinct was like something was just not 
not quite right. And she couldn't really get the pediatrician to take her seriously. You know, they did the like snap, snap. Oh, look, she looked, she's fine. And so when they let her know, hey, we're doing vision screenings and hearing screenings at the preschool, she got me registered. And that's what I failed. <laughs> so <laughs> that was finally her hard proof that she's like, no, look, we need to get this taken care of. And she had picked up on things like hold the phone, I'd hold it to my left ear and I wouldn't respond. And then I'd stick it in my right hand and then I would act like I was hearing. So she just always kind of felt like something wasn't quite right. My speech wasn't quite there, but yeah. So your mom was noticing that your speech was a little different than it should have been perhaps at that age. Yes. And she worked with me and I had one good ear. So I I ended up not having to go through speech therapy. I was very lucky in that respect, I guess. But she just knew something wasn't right. And I failed this test until finally got the referral to ENT. And we went to one, and I didn't even realize this until after the last time you and I talked. And then I talked with my mom about, hey, I was on this podcast. And she was like, well, you actually saw two ENTs. I was like, I did? So I, I had no idea. But so we saw one ENT and she was like, oh, we're just going to put tubes in. And my mom's like, is there fluid? And she's like, no. And mom's like, all right, then why? So she was like, okay, not going there. Gonna go somewhere else. Go mom, go. Yeah. Okay. Don't do things that like are not medically indicated, even if a doctor says them. Okay. <laughs> so get to the second ENT. He at least orders like a CT scan. So, you know, they do a CT scan and then just comes back with like, well, God just made her that way. Like that's not a diagnosis, but okay. He was like, it was just a traumatic birth and that caused this. And that was kind of the only explanation that we got. But from the time I was five until I was eight, they brought me back for annual monitoring, being tested every year. But I had a mild to severe loss in my left ear. And my mom's like, does she need a hearing aid? He's like, no, no, not as long as she's making A's and B's, she's all good. And what? And it, it's just going to make the paper crinkling in the classroom loud. It's just going to distract her. So let me just ask you, do you think, you know, speaking of ages and millennials, et cetera, do you really think that things were that different in the level of technology at the time? Or was it the level of awareness, understanding? There's a lot of factors there. I think that in the early 90s, they had the research that showed that most of the unilateral hearing loss kids did okay with speech development. So they weren't concerned. And I think that now we have more research that shows, okay, yeah, but they're very likely to fail one grade, if not two. And that even a mild hearing loss is a big deal if it means that you're not getting 100% of access to sound on the audiogram. So, I mean, yeah, it was analog technology, but like digital was still a decade or so away. I mean, there's no reason why I could not have benefited from tech back then. They did me a disservice. This, but they did the best that they could with the information that they had at the time, or at least that's what I tell myself anyway. And I definitely see that a lot of ENTs and all are much more proactive nowadays, thankfully. Yeah. And also the element of fatigue. I think that's much more addressed now. It's harder to listen. Mental load for sure. Like when I got into grad school and I was reading the textbook on these are all the things that kids with hearing loss have. I was like, okay, are you reading my diary? Because I had all of this. <laughs> yeah. I talk a lot to parents about the social implications and how we do so much for our kids to be friendly and make friends and be respectful and all the things we want for them polite at a level of just like interacting with other humans well okay for example in middle school at one point we had assigned seats and my assigned seat was at the far right end of the table which meant that my bad left ear was facing everyone. And rather than struggle all lunch period to try to talk or listen or whatever, I just started bringing a book. I mean, I love to read. I needed a mental break from like all the focusing I was doing in class and stuff. So they called a parent teacher conference with my mom and told my mom that I was too antisocial because I was reading during lunch and my mom was like are you seriously calling me in here to tell me that my kid reads too much like is that really a thing yeah, yeah she was so mad <laughs> and 
But now I realize that was my coping mechanism. That was how I got a little bit of a break from all of the paying attention in class that I had to do and stuff. When you talk about that, it makes me think that children are so incredibly resilient and they're always doing something for a reason. I also talk about in my (laughs) parenting classes and coaching and things about that children have a behavior for a purpose. They're trying to get something or achieve something from doing that, whether it's screaming and kicking and yelling or whether it's, you know, goody (laughs) two-shoesing. I have found that with a lot of my pediatric and even teenage patients, a lot of times rejection of the devices comes from a place of seeking control. They feel out of control for some reason, out of control with their health or their life or what's going on. And rejection of hearing aids is a way that they can kind of feel like they get control back by making their parents feel out of control. And if they're feeling out of control, how can we make them feel like they are in charge of something? And so counseling, I'm constantly recommending like seeing a therapist, going to counseling, because look, I've dealt with a lot of grief with my own hearing loss. Mine is progressive. And we found that out just about three, four years ago now, I guess it was 2017. So back up a bit. So I um, was diagnosed with the loss. It was stable from the time when I was five until I was about eight. And so when I was eight, the ENT kind of released me from their care. They were like, oh, you know, it's staying stable. We haven't seen a change. So just call us if your grades get bad, I guess. So I didn't see an audiologist again until I was ready to go to college. And I had always made A's and B's in school. My mom was a teacher, but I was nervous about going to university and being in a class with 300 people and who knew what my assigned seat there would be. And I knew that in order to get accommodations, I needed to be registered with the school. And so at the time it was called the Students with Disabilities Department. And now they call it the Office of Accessibility. I went to my students with disabilities department. And I was like, Hey, I got a hearing loss and I want that registered and I want accommodations for my classes. And they were like, yeah, we're going to need a hearing test that's been performed in the last decade. Yeah. Not when you were eight. That's hilarious. Okay. But let me just ask you this all throughout middle school and high school, were you aware? Did you kind of have an understanding? I have a hearing loss in this year and you know, it wouldn't be your responsibility as a child, but you didn't ask, is there something we do about this? Did you ever see a hearing aid or know that existed or any of that? I didn't know anyone with a hearing aid. I had never had the opportunity to listen to one. One had never been recommended for me. I mean, like I said, the doctors told my parents, like, it's just going to distract her. So I just kind of thought, well, I'm deaf in my left ear and there's nothing they can do about that. So this is just how my life is. And my mom taught me to like advocate for myself and to stand up for myself and to tell the teacher, no, I've got to sit in the front of the class. And no, I don't want to sit next to the talker who's going to distract me. And I didn't have an IEP plan. I didn't have like any kind of accommodations and it never even entered my brain that that was something I could ask for or do. All I can think of, oh my gosh, is when it was mandated that I take a foreign language and I get into high school and I'm trying to take Spanish and we had just a boom box with cassette tapes and our tests where we would listen to the cassette tapes and then have to like write out either what they said or respond to it in a foreign language. It was so hard and I never thought to be like, um, can we do this some other way? Because the cassette tape gives me no visual cues. It's incredibly hard. I watched everything with closed captioning at home, but I never thought to ask a teacher like, hey, could you put the captions on the screen or in a com? And I would always be like, I don't know what they said. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I read the wrong pages for homework, you know, 65 through whatever. And it's like, no, it was 55. How hard, how hard you had to work, how much effort you put in, how much overcompensating. I hear your exhaustion just from talking about it. This was so... (laughs) Well, that's how I explain it to my kiddos now is I'm like, okay, you're playing basketball and all your friends are like just run around and dunking and dribbling and passing and whatever. And when you have hearing loss that's untreated, it's kind of like you're wearing weights on your arms and on your legs and you're on earth and they're on the moon. They're on a different 
field than you and you're having to work that much harder to compete with them on the same level we wouldn't do that to you in sports why do you want to do that in English class yeah and oh my goodness to take that metaphor even further I hear sometimes people will say it's not fair why should they get an advantage if you give this child like super jumper boots, then they're going to jump higher than the other kids. Like I've literally heard people say that they shouldn't get extra help. They shouldn't get a crutch, which is my worst word ever. Like if someone breaks their leg, they need a crutch. <laughs> I would much rather not have a disability and not have accommodations. <laughs> so, like, uh, you're so right. I right there with you all the time. So then you came to the university office you got your hearing test and look at that. You were ready to kind of advocate for yourself at that point. Oh yeah. Gold stars. <laughs> so I get tested and they're like, wow, oh my gosh, you have a ton of hearing loss. And you know, have you ever thought about wearing a hearing aid? And I was like, well, I mean, I hadn't, but I've, I've never listened to one. And they were like, well, do you want one? And so I said, well, do I need one? And they're like, Probably not. You, you know, you've been getting along this time. You're just, you're fine. Don't worry about it. And I was like, okay. No. <laughs> the way you made that, I was like panels of a comic strip. And I'm like <laughs> at the edge of my seat. <laughs> so once again, I just walk on out the door. My little form saying that I need preferential seating and I maybe need a note taker. And so they let me leave again. Oh, so man. I started off with a theater and opera like I mean I had a theater scholarship to Auburn I was a theater major I was taking opera classes I had this idea that I was going to be a Broadway star and that I was going to get my degree in like music therapy so I wouldn't have to be a waitress on the weekends I could do like music therapy and then be in the arts but Auburn didn't have a music therapy program but they had speech therapy and they had audiology and so I was like, well, if I do my undergrad degree in like communication disorders, then maybe I won't have to take as many remedial classes to get my master's as a music therapist. And so that was kind of the plan. And so I had to take audiology 101 and I got like a 100 in the class and I just loved it. And I just connected with it. And that was my like, oh my gosh, there's stuff we can do about hearing loss. And my professor was like, come to the dark side. It's audiology 101. That's the one. Yes. <laughs> I loved it. And my classmates ended up fitting me with my first hearing aid and it just changed my life. I burst into tears. It was such a huge difference. It was amazing. But we still didn't know why I had the loss. I just knew I was born that way. And so fast forward a few years down the road, I was working at this primary care doctor's office and we were doing kind of like a team building exercise. And so we went to this place called Sky Zone, which has like trampolines, rock walls and all this indoor stuff. And I also have a heart condition, but I've got a pacemaker now and like it's managed, but I never really did sports or anything as a kid because I, I had the heart thing. I had the hearing thing. I wear glasses. So I was like, well, I'm an adult, but I'll just be careful. So I go and jump on the trampoline. And when I get off 30 minutes later, I had vertigo, I had screaming tinnitus in my right ear, and I could tell my hearing had dropped. So I thought I'd caught a virus. I had seen a couple of sudden hearing loss cases in clinic, like the couple weeks preceding. So I was like, I picked up something from a patient. I don't know what's going on. So I immediately like called my primary, got them to call in some oral steroids. I, I made an appointment. I got in to see the ENT like the next day. And these guys, I, I saw some otologists and they were just amazing and ordered a high resolution CT scan and doing trans tympanic steroid shots in my ear. And um, they sit down to go over the films with me and they were like, well, you have a bilateral Mondini malformation. And I was like, Pendred syndrome, you know, and they're like, no, Mondini's can occur on its own without being associated with Pendred syndrome. But have you ever been tested for that? And I was like, no. What? I was like, I mean, I vaguely remember this back from diagnostics in grad school. And either they had missed it or they had not really explained it very well to us because I had no idea. And so one of my best friends, Dr. Sarah Curtis, uh, with Sounds of Life Hearing Center in Ohio, she's a rock star and my best friend. I called her right after I got off the trampoline and I was like, something's wrong. And she's like, girl, 
you're going to have EVA. You're going to have enlarged vestibular aqueduct. I just know it. And darn it if she wasn't right, you know? So she's the one who figured it out. And then these guys just confirmed it. But yeah, Tampa Bay Hearing and Balance, I can't say enough good things about them. They're just fantastic otologists. And so they finally, after 25 years and three different states and I don't know, three, four, five different ENTs, finally got my differential diagnoses. And so I am just so passionate about not only identifying children with hearing loss, but identifying why they have the hearing loss. Because if I had known that I had a form of EVA, I would never have gotten on the trampoline. I had normal photoacoustic emissions out to 15,000 hertz. I had beautiful, full, rich, high-frequency hearing. And after I got off that trampoline, I lost everything above 3,000. If you look at my audiogram, my right ear, most people are going to dismiss it. They're going to be like, you've got a precipitously sloping high-frequency loss at like six and eight. It's mild at three and four. It does fluctuate. And they're going to be like, we don't even aid that. And you had a CT as a kid, so this wasn't picked up until then. No, if I don't wear my aid in that ear, I, I can't hear the S sound. Oh, it was so distorted, so different. I mean, the fact that it was there and it was gone, I grieved. That was really hard for me. Um, you know, I was still very involved in community theater and church choir and all that stuff and music, everything sounded different. I suddenly couldn't hear in restaurants or anywhere where there was any kind of competing noises and stuff. I will never take a high frequency loss for granted again. If someone comes in with a high frequency loss and they're like, I can't hear, I'm not just going to blow it off and be like, it's mild. We can't do anything. No, I'm going to, I'm going to do speech and noise testing. And I'm going to maybe like figure out what I can do to help them because it was hard, but I, I went through depression afterwards. I was in the middle of a play and I got through it, but it was so hard. Gosh, talk about a challenging acoustic environment. It's like, <laughs> And I was having to relearn how to sing my songs without being able to hear the same musical cues. It was so tough. So I went to counseling. That really helped me to talk it out, to get over my grief, over the fact that my body is not working the way I want it to work. It's permanent. You know, it really helped me to reframe it, to kind of get a positive outlook. And I don't think that you have to have hearing loss to be a good audiologist, but I know that these experiences have made me a better one because I get it. I've been, like you said, on that other side of the sound booth, just as much as I've been in the shoes of the professional. And I just connect with my patients in a way that school can't teach you. I mean, it's my truth. It's what I live every single day. And so the plus side of this is that it's uh, given me a, kind of a way to test things as they come out. I'm like, oh, there's something new. Well, let me give that a shot. So I take things for a test drive before I start like doling it out to patients. Okay. I just have one question there about the timeline. The first time you had the hearing aid from your friends at school. So you just got for the left ear. And then what happened was you lost the hearing in the right ear after the trampoline thing. Yes. Yeah. So they fit me with my first aid in 2008 because at the time I had totally normal hearing in my right ear and I had like mild to borderline like severe, maybe it was moderately severe in the high frequencies in my left ear only. And so I was wearing a CIC in my left ear. And then the trampoline incident was in like 2017. And after that, my left ear went to moderate to profound and my right ear went from normal to moderately severe. It fluctuates. So like some days my left ear is not profound and some days it is. And my word recognition scores fluctuate. So sometimes my speech understanding is 92%. Sometimes it's 82%. That's the challenge with EVA. It's, you know, I've got the enlarged vestibular aqueduct and then I've got the incomplete cochlear partitioning. So cochlea is supposed to be two and a half rotations. Mine's only one. And then my vestibular aqueduct is too big. And so it creates this like phantom conductive component. And it's just very, very weird. But so after the trampoline, my CIC wasn't powerful enough for my left ear anymore. And I tried wearing a custom in the right and just plugged me up way too much. So I ended up switching to RIC devices with just a very open fit on the right side and a custom mold on seashell embedded receiver or whatever on the left. 
And, but that was when I got streaming and Bluetooth for the first time. And I probably didn't use it for the first like three months. Cause I was like, eh, I've never had this, whatever. And then I started playing with it and I was like, oh my gosh, I love having an app. I love having the podcast and the books on tape. And, you know, so now I use it every day and I love that. Books on tape, <laughs> audiobooks. <laughs> I'm so, so grateful that you graced us with your story. Really, I feel like that people should hear this and people should know a few lessons that I'm taking away. One, there's no such thing as a mild hearing loss or high frequency hearing loss. That's like, eh, whatever. Any difference in hearing levels probably has some impact on the person, whether it's fatigue or noisy environments, or it just makes hearing more challenging and for children even more so. That's one thing. The other thing is this feeling that things can change. <laughs> this reality that things can change, that the hearing that is now might stay the same or it might not. And that could happen even to anyone who has never had any hearing problems at all with age, with accidents, with all sorts of things. We actually had an episode with Jacqueline Briggs who shared her story. She had a car accident, typical and normal hearing. And then she had a car accident. Now she uses a cochlear implant and she shared her story. You're also reminding me of Dr. Samantha McKinney, audiologist also, who's cochlear implant recipient and an audiologist. Like all the different people in our community who've been interviewed here. I think the stories are so, so important especially for parents who want to know, how do I help? What do I do? So what is some advice you have for the parents listening? You get that differential diagnosis, find out why you have the loss. It might not ultimately change what we do day to day. It might not ultimately change like the recommended treatment, but get the genetic test done, do it. Get that imaging study done, do it. Because it just gives you more information to figure out that roadmap. I would not have jumped on the trampoline if I had known that that was going to cause my hearing to drop more. And I'm not suggesting that we make kids live in a bubble. They gotta be kids, they gotta live. But it's about, I didn't make an informed decision, right? It's about knowing that this is the risk I take. And so if I do this, this could happen. So I think that really seeking out those answers and not just accepting, well, this is the way it is. I mean, I think that that's super important. And then, you know, if kids are having a hard time accepting their diagnosis, get them counseling, let them talk to someone. Like there are counselors that specialize in peds. There's counselors that specialize in working with people who are having a hard time accepting a medical diagnosis it was very hard for me to accept. And of course they told me like, hey, you know, you're one concussion away from being a cochlear implant recipient. Most kids that have EDA are gonna end up with cochlear implants. You're, it's amazing you made it to 30 without needing CI. And I'm like, I don't feel lucky. But sometimes when you feel out of control, then you try to control what you can, whether that's wearing your hearing aid, whether that's controlling what you eat those kinds of behaviors. So I just think that if kids are rejecting their devices, it sometimes is just an indication that there's something internal that they are feeling out of control with. And if you can help them give them their power back, if you can help them feel in control of their life and their situation again, then acceptance with their devices will be better. And I mean, I'm not a counselor. That's not my area of expertise. I'm an audiologist, but it's just, that was my personal experience. And after that, it was really just this light bulb going off that like, oh, okay, it's about control. And so let's help them to feel more in control of their situation so that we can see the behaviors that we want to see and the successes that we want them to have. That's incredible. I'm thinking about what you said for parents that they should consider trying to get answers about the why and the diagnosis. And that for many parents, it's really overwhelming. There's a lot happening in those first weeks and months that that question sometimes gets moved forward. And I think that's appropriate. You know, I don't think it's as the same weight as what the interventions are, but that it shouldn't just be left totally to sit in a back drawer. Like it should come back out a couple months later and then maybe consider it. I know that with my own mother, like after I got my first hearing aid, she felt so guilty. She was like, oh my gosh, why didn't I 
did this for you years ago. I mean, she was following the advice of the experts. They didn't give her great advice, but they gave her whatever the best advice at the time was. So like, I try to remind people to like, just love your kids, just be there for your kids. Like they're still the same kid today that they were yesterday. This is something that is a challenge. We're going to work on it, but like, don't feel like they still are who they were before, right? Nothing's changed. We just, we got a few more challenges that we got to face. Uh, but yeah, it's so much. It was so much going through as an adult. And I'm like, oh, I got a sudden sensory neural hearing loss. I'm an audiologist. I know exactly what to do with that. But that was the blessing and the curse. I knew exactly what my chances of my hearing coming back were. <laughs> And I knew what we could do about it. So I'm like, you give me that treatment, you know, but I also knew the likelihood that it's a 33% chance. Knowledge is a good thing. Knowledge is power. Definitely. I think also specifically when there's a syndromic hearing loss and other parts of the body are affected, specifically ushers, which also vision. So that's one that when there's awareness of that intervention is very different because we know that there's going to be progression of both the hearing loss and the vision as the child grows. So. Right. There wasn't any obvious syndromes. And so it's just like, okay, non-syndromic hearing loss. Like, why is this happening? As it turns out, interestingly, my grandmother, my dad's mom, was diagnosed with otosclerosis in the 1960s. And she underwent a failed stapendectomy. And of course, EVA is very, very commonly misdiagnosed as otosclerosis. Didn't have high resolution CT scans in the 60s. So EVA, it can be just a fluke birth defect, or it could be genetic inherited. So now I'm suspecting that this is actually a inherited thing from my dad's side of the family. Now I feel like we're on a true crime podcast investigating old cold cases from the 60s. I know. Forensic audiology, right? Yes, for sure. Oh my gosh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I'm so, so, so glad to talk to you again. And I know our conversation for some parts is like very audiology techie and all these different words, but I think still very valuable, first of all, for our students and for our colleagues who listen, but parents are in my heart. The whole mission of the podcast is to help parents know that they're not alone with what's going on for their family. And there's a lot of support out there. So reach out. (laughs) If people want to reach you, where can they find you? They can find me on my website, citrushearing.com. I am also on Facebook, uh, Citrus Hearing Clinic, LLC. We have a Citrus Hearing Clinic Instagram. I think my Twitter handle is Citrus Clinic AUD on LinkedIn. So I'm around. You can find me. My last name is pretty unique. Yes. And I have lemons on your mask, your custom mask here. So (laughs) <laughs> we're all citrusy here. We're in the citrus belt here in Florida. We're very close to the citrus tower. And so it's all oranges and lemons and limes. And I'm in the grapefruit room right now. So you've got the pink walls. I've got my Auburn orange room. That's my orange room where my booth is. So that's so awesome that you need to name this room the Pamplemousse room though. That's make it fancy. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to the show. I'm so grateful to you for sharing your story. And for all the listeners, please come and say hi, your biggest takeaways or any questions on Instagram at All About Audiology Podcast. I will see you in the next episode. I'm Dr. Leila Saperstein, and this is the All About Audiology Podcast.